We've taken things that we at least would keep in a desk drawer or a wallet, sometimes even in a safe, and we've decided to put them in our phones or, or, or to put them in something called the cloud. Or, or to, to, in, in, any, in any event, we did these things be, because the digital domain gave us so much power to be able to do things online quickly, easily, conveniently. And I think we did it indifferent to the dangers we were creating for ourselves by putting our precious information, whether it was personal or, or governmental, in locations that were not nearly as safe as they were when we kept them in the physical domain. Let me be very, very candid, all right? I was the director of the National Security Agency here in America, the, the American equivalent of, of ASD. Right? The last 15 years have been the golden age of electronic surveillance. Now, we're not out there stealing in, individual normal citizens' data, all right? But we are out there trying to steal information from foreign adversaries. And I, let me repeat what I just said. It was the golden age of electronic surveillance. And it's also the golden age of electronic surveillance for nation states and criminal gangs and hacktivists and activists who want to do you and Australian citizens harm. So I actually lived through this. I actually played in this game. All right. Uh, I went to San Antonio in the late 1990s, took over something called uh, the Air Intelligence Agency. And the American Air Force was actually forward-leaning in its thinking about this new cyber domain. And my new command, when I arrived, said, General, let me explain to you what's going on here. And they went, land, sea, air, space, cyber. General, it's a domain. It's a location. It's a place. And the way our armed forces have had to defend America down here we're going to have to go up here and defend America as well. Well, you tell an American GI that it's a domain, the first thing he thinks about is, I've got to organize to operate in that domain. And as surely as night follows day, once you've determined that the cyber world is a domain, the American Armed Forces would then organize to operate there. I, while well, I was at NSA created something really awkwardly named Joint Functional Component Command Net Warfare. It was the embryo that later became U.S. Cyber Command. In the industrial age, okay, electrical power grids were all, always considered a legitimate military target. All right? So in World War II, we bombed and destroyed the electrical infrastructure of our enemies. By the time we got to the Gulf War, we didn't have to use iron bombs to create heat blast and fragmentation to destroy power grids. We actually dropped narrow bands of filament on electrical power lines and allowed the lines to short themselves out. Now that made them dark, but it wasn't nearly as destructive. Now we have the ability, through a cyber attack, to just shut the grid down. But we can resurrect it by the flip of a switch again if we take away the, the cyber elements that we've injected. So, so there is a great attraction in terms of operating in the cyber domain that you can actually do things down here that are reversible, more precise, and not nearly as destructive as they have been in the past. So Stuxnet was a weapon comprised of ones and zeros. All right, it was, it was a weapon from the digital domain that was used against the Iranian nuclear facility at Natanz. It, it took over the computer system that was running a whole cascade of centrifuges, about a thousand, gave orders to the centrifuges to spin at self-destructive speeds while telling the operators, essentially, there's nothing interesting to see here, folks. <laughs> it's, everything's normal. And of course, the Iranians didn't know that the centrifuges were self-destructing they, until they began to hear the pop, pop, pop from the centrifuge hall, and about a 1,000 were destroyed. Now look, former director of NSA, former director of CIA, um, during that period of time, I, that was probably, probably an unalloyed good, slowing down what we viewed to be an Iranian nuclear weapons program. But let me, let me describe for you what I just described for you in only slightly different words. Someone, certainly a nation state, because this is too hard to do from the garage or the basement, someone, a nation state, had just used a weapon comprised of ones and zeros during a time of peace to destroy what another nation could only describe as critical infrastructure. Now, even I, 
uh, with my background and looking upon the, the destruction as an unalloyed good, even I recognize that's a really big deal. To my knowledge, the center of gravity of the Chinese effort against the United States and Australia has been really in the theft of information, and really, by and large, the theft of information for commercial profit. All right? Look, I believe it was the Chinese who conducted the massive hack of OPM and stole what? 23 million records from people like me who had security clearances. Frankly, I've said publicly, that's not shame on China. That's the legitimate state espionage. I've actually said publicly that if I were the director of NSA and had the ability to steal that kind of information from China, I'd have done it in a heartbeat, and I would not have had to ask permission from anybody. That's what nation states do. Where I'm really concerned, and where I think Australians should be really concerned, is the Chinese not attacking the Australian government or the American government. Our government should be able to defend themselves. Again, not shame on China, shame on us. They steal our secrets. It's a really unfair fight, though, if a nation state like China attacks private enterprise in Australia or attacks private enterprise in the United States, again, not for legitimate state espionage purposes, but for industrial and commercial advantage. Now, about a year ago, President Xi Jinping was here in the United States, and President Xi agreed that using state organs to steal industrial secrets was illegitimate. And we've actually seen a reduction in Chinese industrial espionage in the 10 months since that visit. So we'll see what this means, but that's a modestly hopeful sign. Um, Zero-day exploits are, are those for which there are no, yet no defenses. And so if your job is to, is to mount espionage or other attacks in the cyber domain, you want zero days. And so it has been the practice of some governments to go out and buy those kinds of things. Now, look, that's very controversial, all right? I understand why. Because you're actually underpinning uh, an effort to make things less secure. All right? and, and so I, I can understand why that's very controversial. You know, we had a grand debate here in, in the United States with regard to Apple and a particular cell phone out in San Bernardino, California. And rather than Apple being forced to open the phone or develop a new operating system to help open the phone, uh, the FBI actually bought the equivalent of a zero day from, from private enterprise in order to get, in, get into the phone. Uh, I'm not prepared to pass judgment on that step, but I am prepared to say, boy, we ought to think that one through. And so there's this grand debate among signals intelligence agencies globally, it's just not an American phenomenon, that once you've discovered a vulnerability, what do you do with it? Right? Do you share it with others to protect your citizens' information? Or do you keep it to yourself so that you can exploit the vulnerability to, frankly, steal other nations' information? What we need most in the cyber domain right now is policy clarity. What's allowed, what's not allowed. What is it we intend to do, what is it we don't intend to do. What we think is the legitimate use of espionage power, both domestically and abroad, and what is not. We don't have that policy consensus. We don't have that policy consensus because we haven't had an adult discussion amongst our citizens and our, our policy makers. We haven't had the adult discussion because we do not have an agreed body of knowledge with regard to what is or is not possible, is or is not happening in the cyber domain. And we don't have that agreed body of knowledge because so much of this is, in my view, overclassified by the American government. And let me add, American business keeps too much of this secret as well. So I think, all in all, we would benefit with a lot more transparency about what's going on in the cyber domain that gets the common body of knowledge, that animates the discussion, that then allows us to arrive at some common policy principles.